Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Be more human. I truly believe that in the end, the most human company will win. And so we need to examine every touch point with our customers, every phone call, every text message, every complaint, every meeting, every negotiation. How can we show our faces, our smiles, our hearts, our passion to be the most human company in our space? Because the most human company will win. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with founder of the Australian Organic Food Company, Adrian Sester, and with behavioural economist John Howe, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Mark Schaefer a globally recognized blogger, speaker, educator, consultant, and author of multiple books, including one of my favorite marketing books, Marketing Rebellion. As executive director of Schaefer Marketing Solutions, he specializes in marketing strategy and social media workshops. Clients include both startups and global brands such as Adidas, J&J, Dell, AT&T, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.K. government. Mark is also the co-host of The Marketing Companion, one of the top 10 marketing podcasts on Apple Podcasts. And he's lectured at Oxford University, Princeton, and many other prestigious institutions. In our discussion today, Mark talked to me about why the job of any business and marketer is to cut through the noise and be trusted. We talked about the complex maze of customer journeys and why it's critical to connect with people where they are. And Mark explained why providing insights and connecting the dots rather than just sharing information will be critical to success in the fourth marketing rebellion. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Mark Schaefer. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Louisville, Tennessee in the USA, Mark Schaefer, who's a globally recognized keynote speaker, an educator, business consultant, and author of seven best-selling marketing books, including my favorite, Marketing Rebellion, also Return on Influence, and The Content Code. He's co-host also of the Marketing Companion podcast. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Mark. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this all day, Jürgen. <laughs> Gleb Sapersky, who was our guest on episode 271 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, introduced us and suggested we have a chat with you. And I thought that was wonderful because, I, as I said, I, I'm a big fan of the Marketing Rebellion book. So a big hello to Gleb. Oh, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. We had a great chat on that episode too about um, never trusting your gut to make decisions. Mm. Now, in Marketing Rebellion, you kind of really push that as a movement, so I'm looking forward to explore that. Now, I know you you had a corporate career with Alcoa for many yeah. years. Um, how, yes. did, how did 
your years at Alcoa, and I know you did marketing there. How did that fuel your passion for human-centered marketing? It killed it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you know, I, 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 I said that really sort of just to be funny, but Alcoa was a great company. I had a great career there. And the thing that was unusual about the company when I was there, now it changed, you know, over the years, but it was really sort of like a family company. Hmm. Uh, it was a big company, Fortune 100 company, Dow Jones Industrial at the time when I was there. And yet the, the president of the company was sort of like the dad. <laughs> yeah. You know, the CEO was kind of like your grandfather. I mean, it, it was really a company that tried to do the right thing, tried to treat its people the right way, attracted the best talent, and uh, really took care of people. So it was a great experience for me. And certainly uh, they, were, they were great to me. And uh, so uh, one of the things I found here again is, you know, when I was in the company, I was, I was always like learning and pushing and being challenged by all the great people that worked there. And when I got out of the company, I realized how much I really learned <laughs> because outside of Alcoa, it's like, wow, I could run these companies with the experience that I had at Alcoa. So it was a, it was a very impactful experience for me and a, and a great experience. Hmm. So when, when did you, when you left Alcoa and, and started out on your own, when did you start down the track of writing books? Well, so I, I came to sort of a crossroads in my career where uh, my job with Alcoa was, I was the global director of, of e-business, which was still sort of a new thing back then, but we were way ahead of our time and pioneering a lot of new ideas. And I had had that job for like four years, five years, and I was ready to do something new. And uh, Alcoa wanted to transfer me to Europe. And for some personal reasons, I didn't, couldn't really go to Europe. So I thought this is a good time to try something new. So I started to teach. I started to consult. And of course, to be an effective teacher or consultant around 2009, you really had to immerse yourself in social media because that was the new thing. And so sort of on a whim, I started the blog for the simple reason that I wanted to learn how to do it. It was an experiment. Mm. Well, I'll be darned. The blog kind of took off because how many bloggers back then had 27 years worth of, you know, marketing experience. And so I think I, I sort of had a distinctive voice. I tried to tell the truth. I tried to connect the dots. I didn't have an agenda. I wasn't trying to evangelize anything or sell anything. I just try to tell the truth. And I think that tone and that voice was, was appreciated. And so my blog became popular and that got the attention of some book pub publishers uh, because uh, they were hungry for new books on, uh, on, uh, on social media and marketing in general back then. And so I kind of, one of the ideas I had was that, and I think, this will lead into a lot of the things that you saw in Marketing Rebellion, is that the, the, the power was shifting in the world. When you and I were growing up in business, companies had all the power. Media had all the power. Television stations, newspapers, radio stations. The chance for you and I to become known in this world was almost impossible. That was someone else's decision. You had to go to the right university, have the right career, maybe marry into the right families. Well, that's all changed because today someone like you can create a podcast. Someone like me can create a blog. We're grabbing our own opportunity for our voice to be heard. We're initiating and unleashing our own power and making a dent in our world, the, the you know, our own way. And as that accumulates, the power is now shifting mm. from those traditional places to us. So I had this idea for a book about that. I was lucky enough to have a publisher take a risk on that. And that became my first book, Return on Influence. 
and it turned out to be a big hit. So that sort of got the ball rolling. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting journey. I I think you, the idea of you know writing a regular blog and getting ideas out there certainly can get the attention. And I think the other side of the power shift is that people now have access to independent information so they can go online and research things before they buy and and also have conversations with complete strangers uh, um, and connect with complete strangers who may have already bought the same thing and get their their um, experience before they make their decision yeah absolutely i mean that's better than any advertisement <laughs> that's right yeah well, you talk in the advice of a, the advice of a stranger better than any advertising. Yeah, that's right. Well, that that's one of the fascinating things that uh, there's some research that says we trust the advice of strangers on the internet a lot more than than the companies. I think there's yes, of course. There's quite a lot of research that has data supporting that. So, yeah. so in um in marketing rebellion, I mean, you talk about the most human company wins, and one of the things that I um always am fascinated by and and frustrated by in some ways is is with all the technology that we have today and the marketing automation systems that are around um, people tend to forget that there's actually a person on the other end of every interaction and yeah often abdicate to the technology and that's something that you talk about quite a bit in marketing rebellion the over reliance on tech so talk to us a little bit about the whole philosophy this idea of the most human company winning yeah. Well, the, the I think the purpose of the book is really a wake up call because as, as I was doing research, it started actually, Jurgen, with research I was doing for my clients. And I started to come across reports from, you know, Accenture and Deloitte and McKinsey that were sort of busting my view of what marketing was supposed to be about. And I was learning things like the decline of loyalty, that 87% of our customers aren't loyal and they don't wanna be loyal. Mm. I learned things about sort of the dissolution of the sales funnel, the chaos, the, you know, the tangled mess of the customer journey today. There really isn't one. Yeah. And these are ideas and terms that we sort of take for granted. Advertising, nobody sees it anymore. If they see it, they don't believe it. And as you start to look at where the world is today, it, it, it creates a different view of marketing. And I think the most important statistic in the book is that uh, it comes from McKinsey. Uh, they did this study of, uh, I think, 200,000 customer journeys. And they said that two-thirds of our marketing is occurring without us, that the purchasing decisions really are having no impact from corporate communications or marketing. It's coming from, from conversations and recommendations, as you said, reviews from other people. And so you think, oh my goodness, two thirds of our marketing is occurring without us. Mm. How do we get invited to that conversation? That requires an entirely new view of what marketing is about. And that's the core idea behind the book. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty stunning statistic, isn't it? And it's, I think, you know, you mentioned customer journeys. I think there's there's so many different journeys or, or maybe there's one journey, but people are at different places of that journey and they each have their own path that goes through their own individual customer journey and and advertising to me and and the concept of marketing funnels are that everybody has to fit into one journey and everybody starts at the same point which is you know seems to be completely counterintuitive anyway well that's absolutely right and i think you're again one of the most interesting studies that was done, I believe it was the fall of 2018, Google came out with a series of white papers that showed even people doing search on Google, they could not detect like a pattern. They could not, they could not see a, you know, 
a repeatable customer journey for even people searching for the same thing. They came from other places and they went to different places. And that was sort of Google's conclusion, even in a search function, that the customer journey is sort of over. Hmm. So the whole concept behind the most human company wins is based on building relationships, right? And and so no, not 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 necessarily. Okay. And 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 here's what I mean by that. Um. And and actually, you've, it's kind of a hot button for me. <laughs> so you've taken this conversation in a wild new direction. You didn't even realize. One of the issues I think with marketing is that we we become too self-absorbed and too self-important, where we believe that marketing is about a relationship, that we need to build a community. Now, if you think about all the products you bought in the last week, let's say, all right, so I'm learning how to do watercolor art. So I bought some materials. I bought some paper. I bought some brushes. I bought some paint. I bought some material to fix things around my house. Now, off the top of my head, I cannot even name the brands associated with those materials. I do not want a relationship with those companies. In fact, I want them to leave me alone. Yeah. I really don't want to hear from them. I don't want to be on any list and I don't want getting emails. So 98% of the products we buy, we don't want a relationship. The four, the old good old four P's of marketing still work. What's the price? What's the product? What's the promotion? What's the placement, right? How is it distributed? Can we sell it in a different way? Can we sell it at a different price? All those things still work. And one of those four P's is not necessarily a relationship. Now, how does that jive with this idea of my book that the most human company wins? So marketing today, business today is a war for attention. Mm. Uh, there was a very interesting statistic. There was a book actually, you know, that you, you're interested in people to interview for your show. Matthew Sweezy created this new book called The Context Marketing Revolution. Uh, it just came out a few uh, months ago. I think it's one of the best business books I've read in the last five years. And one of the things that Matthew uh, puts out there through his research is that something very significant happened June 24th, 2009. Here's what happened. The amount of information on the web created by human beings for the first time exceeded the amount of information created by media companies. And we entered this new phase of the world. You know, back whenever we had to get our news from a television station or a newspaper or a magazine, we, had, we were in era of limited media. There were only so many TV stations, only so many magazines. But today, anybody can produce content, as we're doing right in this moment. Mm. And we're in this era of infinite media. So the job of any business, any marketer, any employer today has to be able to cut through that noise and be trusted. That is the business issue of our day. The big problem is that most big companies today are still following this old mindset of marketing where you're advertising to people and you're broadcasting messages. We're seeing this happen in quite a powerful way during this pandemic. So here in America, all the big companies are putting out all these ads and they're saying, we're with you, we're with you. And there was actually a video that went viral on YouTube. Someone had edited all these advertisements <laughs> together to show that they're exactly the same. <laughs> they're not with us, they don't care. They're following a script that some advertising company did. 
that is not what we want today. That is not what we desire as consumers. Consumers have a different expectation of businesses today. It's not necessarily a relationship, but we want to trust them. Hmm. We want to know who's there. Is there a real person there? Or is this someone, you know, like the Wizard of Oz who's talking behind a screen that's scripted by an advertising agency? And that's where eventually the most human company will win. Hmm. And that's where we're seeing today that the smaller companies who can pivot, who can get down in the trenches and really help people and connect to people in a real way, in a vulnerable way, in an emotional way, those are the companies that are going to win. And you started you know, talking about technology. That's the big problem. We're addicted to technology. We're obsessed with technology. We over rely on technology, not because it's bad, but because it's good. It's easy. Yeah. It's cheap. We can get 9,000 email addresses for a dollar and we're going to spam all of them. But that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean it's the human thing to do. It doesn't mean that that's what our customers want or expect from us. And we've got to get retuned in to where the world really is today, what they really want from us, or we will lose because it is true. The most human company will win. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, clarifying. How about that, that, for, our, how about yeah. that for, for an unexpected rant? <laughs> well, that's great. I'm all up for our unexpected rants. <laughs> I think one of the things you mentioned there, and it, it was sort of occurring to me as you're talking, it's it's the emotional connection that is really important and particularly like we're in the pandemic right now and um, we we probably will still be in the pandemic when the listener is listening to this unfortunately um and sure. to have somebody actually hear about our problems and and you know show some empathy and understanding of our problems and rather than try and sell something to us and and act as if it's business as usual um come back with a philosophy of how can I help you in, in your situation right now? Yeah. Right. Hmm. Well, that's how I'm trying to counsel my clients and customers is, you know, how right now, all of our customers, whether you're B2B or B2C, our customers are suffering in some way. Now, you know, maybe in Australia, you're, you're more ahead of where we are here in America, but here in America, we still have a lot of people who are suffering. We've had a lot of job loss. And so everyone I know is grieving the loss of something. Hmm. It could be grieving the, the loss of ability to go to your favorite pub or go to a movie or a concert or simply work in an office without children crawling all over you. And so grief is usually a word we associate with, you know, losing a, a loved one. But I think today we're losing our hopes, our dreams, our financial stability, uh, you know, our, our vision of, of the future, uh, our ability to be free in some ways. And so it's sort of like, if someone was really grieving at a funeral, would you come up to them and give them a disc, a 20% discount on your services? <laughs> you know, it, that, and, but that's what's happening to a lot of, you know, with a lot of desperate companies today. Instead, you would say, wow, you know, boy, you must be really hurting right now. Uh, we've done business together for a long time. What can I do for you right now? How can I help you right now? Because I am here for you right now. And I'm going to be here for you in the future. And that's really the attitude that sales and marketing needs to, to take right now. Mm. Yeah. And if you take that example and, and break it down into, hey, it's, it's grief, um, then that's the human thing to do, isn't it? So I think that's, that's the point of the book for me is if you remember what's the right thing to do as a human being to another human being or with another human being, um, if you remember that and then use the technology to enable those interactions yes. to happen at greater scale or quicker right. or 
at more depth, then then I think that's yeah. that's where technology has its role. I think that's a very important point. And I don't want people to think I'm anti-technology. Mm. I mean, we're using technology right now to create value together. We can see each other's faces as we're recording this through this technology, right? So Jurgen, you're using technology in a very effective way to tear down barriers between you and your customers and your fans so that they can hear your voice and experience your intelligence and your, your commentary. And that's a wonderful use of technology. It's a wonderful way to be human. And so that's a great example. Hmm. Thanks for that. All right. Now, um, you, you've recently put out a short little book that's free. We'll promote it as well as part of the um, information later on called the business, uh, the pandemic business playbook. And one of the fascinating things about that, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the pandemic already, and I, I think you touch on a lot of those things there, but one of the things you come up or you, you mentioned there is the new normal after the crisis. What's that going to look like? And I know you've got some views about that. So talk to us a little bit about what the impact um, of a new normal might be and, and how you see that. Well, the reason I, I did this was because, you know, a lot of my content that I would have normally been creating just seemed uh, irrelevant in the context of the crisis that we're in. And so I pivoted and I started creating content to really sort of connect with people where they are now, to help people where they are now. And people loved it. I mean, some people commented and said, oh my gosh, you know, Mark, these posts, they've helped me so much. This is the best content I've read during this crisis. And so I sort of was out ahead of the game a little bit. And I compiled some of these ideas into this pandemic uh, playbook. And the real purpose here is to give people hope and give people something they can hold on to in this world where all of a sudden uncertainty is the normal. And if you dwell in uncertainty, if you dwell in this one question, what if we will go crazy hmm. because so much is unknowable and so much is changing so fast. So what I hope to do through this little playbook is to give people a few ideas of what they can hold on to now that are knowable, that they can start thinking about and working toward what's going to happen next. And so there's a lot of ideas in this little book, but the one that I think is most important is to begin to visualize how your customer is going to be different, how they're changing right now. There are a lot of behaviors that are going to be uh, adopted and transcend this crisis and the chaos that we're in right now. People are learning new habits. Let me give you a quick example. So uh, I actually had the virus. My wife had the virus. She picked it up on a ski trip came home, brought it home. She was sick for about two weeks or so. I was sick for about three weeks. And then through the quarantine and everything, we, we were locked up with this disease for about 50 days. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't see anybody. And we had, you know, how are we going to get food? So we found this service called HelloFresh. They bring these ingredients to your house. They teach you the recipe. You can, and then you can make these healthy recipes and you don't have to go to the store. So we decided that we like it. We're healthy again. I'm back to work. I'm hiking. I'm playing tennis. I feel healthy. But we decided we like this little mm -hmm. thing. And a couple of days a week, we're going to still get these boxes because it's teaching us new recipes. Now, think about this, Jurgen. We are buying food through a new channel we did not know even existed in January. That's profound. And these little things, these little consumer behaviors 
are, are going to be adding up in big ways for almost every company that exists today. Our relationship with food, our relationship with communications, our relationship with working, with education, with our children, almost everything is changing in some way. And what we need to be thinking about is think about our core competencies in our businesses. What is the probability, not the worst case, not the best case, what's the highest probability that our customers are going to be changing? What's the highest probability that our customers are still going to have a budget for our products when we get to the end of this thing? Hmm. What's the highest probability some of our customers are our competitors are going to be going away or new competitors like HelloFresh are going to be coming in. You know, we're smart enough to know we're, we can observe these things happening now to start thinking about what are the high probabilities we can start to collect and make a projection of what our world's going to be about. Mm. Yeah, I love that example. Um, I'm a fan of HelloFresh, actually. <laughs> we've got that here. Oh, too. that's great. Yeah, we've got that cool. here, too. We've actually been using it even before the pandemic. But um, for the reason that, that you say, the convenience and they teach you recipes and, and also yeah. the quantities are, are just enough for the meal for just the right. two people. Yeah. So you don't have leftovers and you know bits and pieces right. that float around and you're not sure what to do with. Um, so there's a convenience factor. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is the idea of experiences. And I think there's a, a huge opportunity there because people can't travel, for example. People can't, uh, the wine industry is doing this really well here. And I, I believe in California, there's a lot um, happening too in this in that field that um, people can't travel to the winery and do wine tasting. So there's virtual wine tasting springing up now and other experiences like that, that people use the technology, the online for to provide people experiences in lieu of traveling to places. So um, a friend of mine in Japan is doing tea ceremonies and virtual tours of of temples and tea houses where the, the wow. tea ceremony takes place. And of course, what that means is, first of all, it provides the opportunity to those people that normally would travel there and have the experience to still have it in a different form. But it also provides the opportunity now all of a sudden to offer that experience to people that would never travel there because they can't afford it or it's too far, it's too far away or whatever it might be. But now all of a sudden the market for that activity is, is much bigger. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it sure is a, a wonderful idea and a wonderful opportunity and, and, you know, from an academic standpoint, I mean, from a personal standpoint, what's going on in the world is very sad and disturbing. Mm. From an academic standpoint, there's no more interesting time you could possibly be alive to just observe what's happening and try to think about what's next. And one of the counterintuitive things that's happening is that in many cases, content consumption is actually going down. Hmm. Now, streaming television, of course, that is going up. But a lot of other content like podcasts, blogs, and even some of these experiences is going down. Why? Because people are exhausted. Their routines are broken. When do you listen to a podcast? On my commute. Hmm. Oh, guess what? <laughs> I don't have a commute anymore. I'm working from home. So a lot of the content consumption is in disarray right now because routines are broken and people at the end of the day are simply exhausted from being on a computer or homeschooling or whatever you know we need to do to survive right now. Now, so I am a big fan of these content opportunities, these experience opportunities, but I think a key word to focus on for any business thinking about this is superior. You have got to create something really unique and, and superior. So, you know, if you're a winery and you're doing wine tasting, if everyone's doing wine tasting, you've got to get, it's going to get lost, mm. right? So I don't know what the answer is. Maybe it's naked wine tasting. <laughs> Maybe it's wine tasting with my dogs. 
Maybe it's wine tasting while I'm hiking. I mean, I don't know, but you've got to create with some, you know, some point of differentiation to, to, you know, to stand out in all this noise and, uh, and create an audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important point, I think. And the other thing that I've noticed with the pandemic coming on is that the people that are producing content or, or there's so many more bits of content that seem to be uh, popping up in my inbox, for example. So everybody yeah, say, oh, there's yeah. a webinar tomorrow. Um, do you have time for this webinar tomorrow? So instead of giving you a week or two weeks notice about a webinar and sending it out to the trusted list, now all of a sudden there's everybody's doing webinars and I think you've got time to participate all over. So it it's just gotten so much more noisy. That's been my yeah. I, I don't I, know how you. I, I heard, I, I I some I heard a statistic, and I haven't been able to to find the source, but someone told me that LinkedIn reported that the amount of content on LinkedIn since March has increased by seventy six percent. Wow! <laughs> so it's almost doubled. That's just LinkedIn. Mm. All right. I already had enough content on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. And now since March has doubled. So that sort of illustrates uh, the problem when you, I mean, look, you can't even really do advertising right now because all the studios have shut down. Mm. I have a friend who is a brand manager for, uh, for uh, Adidas or, or Adidas as it's pronounced in most parts of the world. And he said, I just had uh, an advertising shoot canceled with David Beckham because of the virus. He said, do you realize how hard it's going to be to reschedule (laughs) David Beckham? You know, so basically, you know, creative processes are shutting down. So we need to be turning to something like experiences and content, but now everybody's doing experiences and content. So you've got to find a way to stand out. Hmm. Well, the other thing you mentioned earlier about, cutting through that noise and being being the trusted source or the the trusted partner provider whatever it might be in business so what what are some of the other things that people can do to kind of build that trust factor well you know honestly you know the the most important thing i think is obviously we need to focus on fighting to the other side right we've got to do what we need to do to conserve our cash, to conserve our resources, to serve our customers very wisely and compassionately right now. But the other thing, if it's the right time and the opportunity is there, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is this idea of building a personal brand. It's one of the things I talk about in the Marketing Rebellion book, that increasingly the personal brand is the brand. Hmm. The brand equity is with people, not necessarily because you're lemon scented or you clean better than, you know, this other soap over here. People want to know who's behind it, who's making it and why, what do you stand for? And so the personal brand is a process. Uh, The book that I wrote before Marketing Rebellion, that's the question that I wanted to ask is, can anybody become known? Do you have to be an extrovert? Is there some sort of you know, charisma or special sauce? And the answer is no, that there is a process. I, you know, I went down this rabbit hole. I ended up interviewing 97 people who are known in their field all across the world. And what I found was every single person did the same four things to become known. So, I mean, that's another idea that I, I wrote this book called Known. It's easy to remember. It's easy to find. And it talks about this process. And I think this is critically important right now. And here's why. Not everybody's going to make it. Hmm. You know, there's going to be a shakeout. I mean, just in the last two weeks, I am having a lot of friends right now who are sending me resumes because they lost their job. They're going through a reorg. And, you know, it's heartbreaking. Now, if you're known... And the other job candidates are not. You have an advantage 
immediately. You have a permanent advantage. So create, working on your personal brand, creating content that's useful, helpful, that stands out in some way, that fuels the personal brand is a very important activity right now, especially for college students. You know, I have a stepson just got out of graduate school and you know, it's one of the things he's struggling with right now is, you know, all the job opportunities are going away. And so if you do have a personal brand that connects with people who can help you, that is a big advantage that can carry you through the next year and the next 10 years. Mm. Yeah. Good advice. Now, um, one of the things you talk about that fascinated me in the book, you, uh, in the, at the last chapter, you talk about the fourth rebellion. So what, what are yeah. some of the issues there and some of the trends you see there around the so-called fourth rebellion? Well, it's so funny that you brought that up because I was just thinking about it based on a news article that I saw this week. So, so when we talk about this fourth rebellion in the book, I start the book with a little history lesson, and I show that consumers have been rebelling against marketers and advertising uh, people who take advantage of them for more than 100 years. Mm. And I sort of tell the story that we're actually in a third rebellion. And at the end of the book, I think about, well, what would be the, what would be the fourth rebellion? And I was just reading, you know, uh, an article that talks about the, the insane levels of information that are being collected about you. And even down to a molecular level, uh, you know, to the level of your DNA, mm. right, could, could possibly be used now in, to, to, to sell you stuff. And, and again, unfortunately, where corruption can occur in our world, corruption will occur in our world. And the source of the corruption that people are rebelling against right now is that companies are trying to control us. And they don't understand, wait a minute, the consumers are in control. You don't have a sales funnel anymore. We own the customer journey. We don't want you to broadcast to us. We want you to come alongside us and help us. That's the rebellion. Mm. Now, you could think about the fourth rebellion would be when you get to a point where companies know so much about you they can start marketing things to you before you even know you really need it. It almost suggests um, not just privacy, but free will. Uh, you know, wait a minute. What makes you think I need this product? What makes you think I need this product? Oh, you've got scientific evidence that show I need this product. Well, you know what? I want to make those decisions. You know, I don't know if I'm right. But it's a thought experiment that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And and I think um, it would make a great it would make a great book title too. Yeah. The Fourth Rebellion: The Fight for Free Will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're seeing, we're seeing examples of that playing out now, where um, you know, regardless of whether it's the right thing to do or not, or whether it's the um, it's good for you or not, people are rebelling against having to stay home or having to wear masks yeah. is, is a good one or, or having to keep social distance. And, and we're unfortunately seeing the impact of that here in Australia too, certainly where I am. Um, it's things are, have gone backwards in the last couple of weeks. So it, it certainly is a trait of human behavior, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I think it's an interesting idea that, you know, if if we see this sort of um, self reliance playing out on the in the news, how does that play out eventually? You know, in the in the business and marketing world as well. Hmm. All right. Well, this is fascinating, Mark. I could go on talking marketing and human behavior for ages, but I'd certainly encourage people to download that business pandemic playbook because that's uh, 
for free available on your website without even giving away their email, if I remember correctly. And nope, it's just for free. Yeah. And um, if you like what you see there, then check out the books and we'll speak about those in a moment. I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. And I've got five questions that hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. I'm hoping to. <laughs> So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Well, it's, it's, it's something that you need to do, but it's, but I find it very difficult today. So, and that is to relax. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's, it's really hard to innovate on demand. Mm. And I think innovation today, you have to be aware of your environment. You have ideas that are, bombarding you constantly. So you have to be aware of the ideas. You have to record the ideas. And then at some point, you, you need some, some quiet time to reflect on the ideas. And the problem, frankly, I'm having is that with the, you know, the constant bad news and the stress of the world, it's difficult to really get in a space where you can free your mind and, and be creative. I, I, I can't be stressed and be creative at the same time. I don't think I'm alone in that. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah. No. So, so maybe we've got, maybe we've got creativity challenges in the world right now. Yeah. Well, I certainly agree with you that the, the, all the bad news that we're hearing right now is very stressful. And um, I, I certainly, um, I love to go on a morning bike ride and that's that's kind of my relaxation, even though sometimes I push myself physically, but that's always a time where the brain relaxes and, and I come up yeah. with some new ideas. But one of the things I do at the moment, I listen to the news and get the updates and hear all the numbers and people suffering and so on. And then at some point I say, I've got to, got to go and get some comedic relief. So I go and listen to some of the comedians um, Making fun of people, <laughs> and, you know, in, in particularly the politicians. It's always good to make fun of the politicians uh, and have a good laugh kind of helps to relieve the stress a little bit. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? You know, what I've found is that um, an individual cannot think out of the box. We basically have a box. Um <laughs> Uh, by the time we're 15, we have a mental framework developed, uh, whether we like it or not. And we, we tend to think in certain ways. Now, true breakthrough ideas come from combining boxes. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, going back to the Marketing Rebellion book, if you read it all the way to the end, there's a little extra piece of content I have at the end where I talk about my Da Vinci group. So what is the Da Vinci group? Well, I was inspired when I learned about Leonardo Da Vinci, I, who was arguably the most creative person who's ever lived in history. A lot of his innovations came through collaboration. Mm. He was a very popular guy. He loved to have dinner parties. And they would sit around and they would think big thoughts and they would draw things. And, and if you look at the, the, the origination of some of his biggest ideas, they started with somebody else. It was ideas building on ideas. And that's the idea of combining boxes, where even with Da Vinci, his breakthrough ideas were inspired by building on the suggestions of other people. And that's really the most powerful source of breakthrough ideas for me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that analogy to Da Vinci. And the other thing, um, I don't know if you know the book by, um, is it Michael Gelb who wrote uh, Lessons from Da Vinci? And he talks about how Da Vinci was across all the different art and science and knowledge forms yeah. and, and was connecting the dots from things he observed in all of those. You'll, you'll, find this, you'll find this interesting. Last year, 
I got to meet and interview Walter Isaacson, who wrote the new Da Vinci book. Mm. And he also wrote the Steve Jobs book. Yeah. And also an important book on Einstein and Benjamin Franklin. And I asked him, what is the nature of genius? And he said to him, genius is, is, is two things. He said, it's endless curiosity with the ability to see patterns. Hmm. And I, I, I think that's also a good formula for your idea about innovation. Endless curiosity across lots of different things. And then being able to see those patterns and connect dots in a new way. That's really uh, you know, a trigger for innovation if there ever was one. Mm. Yeah, I love that. All right. Now, what's the? do you have a favorite resource that you use most often? Oh, was this was this a question about the platform or something? Well, it doesn't have to be a platform. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, we talk, we've talked a lot about technology. Uh, you know, a favorite resource. You know, I don't know. I guess, you know, I I read a a, a, a lot of different things. Um, I I like history and nature. Um, you know, it's funny. I read the news on the New York Times every day and and at the bottom way at the bottom of the you know the pa page 1 on the on the internet they'll talk about politics they'll talk about all this stuff all the bad news <laughs> and down at the bottom there's always a story about some new sea creature that they found <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'll click on yeah. you know or oh my gosh look at this they just found this 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 pulsar and they think they know what's happened and or they've they've detected energy coming from black holes that are colliding i'll always click on that yeah uh you know or if there's something cool or different about you know history or art i'll click on those things and that that helps me connect the dots so i mean I, there really isn't a single resource that i that i that i go to i'm i'm kind of a kind of a polymath in my in my interest yeah yeah well it comes back to what i was saying about leonardo da vinci before well here's a couple of fun facts because you, you've triggered that thought in in my mind um i was watching a documentary on australian animals last night on netflix and there were two things i learned that really struck me and i thought oh, i didn't know that one was there's a, a big um Coconut, uh, is it coconut parrot? Uh, the biggest parrot in Australia is a big black parrot. And mm. as part of their mating rituals, the males break off twigs and sticks and actually beat them with their, um, with their legs. They actually beat a rhythm. And it's unique for each, um, each bird, each male. So they play wow. music effectively, <laughs> a rhythm. I, I knew at some point we would get to the mating ritual section of the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other fascinating one, this goes away from the mating. This is a more feeding one. Um, the, uh, there's a, a forest area in the north of Australia where the Aboriginals, um, as part of managing the land, set fires and burn out all the grass to protect the trees from you know the dry season and, and serious fires later on. And... At that time, when they do that burning, there's lots of insects that fly up and these uh, kites come along and feed. And there's thousands of these kites come in and feed and it's a feeding frenzy of all the insects. But the fascinating thing is that they then pick up burning twigs and carry them further afield and light fires in other places because they've figured this out wow. that they can, you know, if they wow. do that, they can trigger this insect migration in other spots. So they're actually, yeah. they're actually fire bugs. Wow. That's crazy. We, I, I saw something similar to that in, in our area, we have this bird called an osprey. It's like a sea eagle. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, we've got these, uh, big black flies that are, they, they lay their eggs in the trees and then they start hatching and then they hover over the water. And when these, blood, these bugs hover over the water, then the fish come up and start to you know, grab these bugs 
and then the ospreys can find the fish and they'll go and catch them. Well, what, what I've seen is that the ospreys will go fishing. They'll go to one of these trees and they'll start shaking the branches <laughs> so the bugs fall off. When the bugs fall off, the fish come and the osprey goes down, go down and just pick up easy prey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so connecting the dots, it's not just a human trait. <laughs> That's yeah. Right. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Well, the best way to keep a project on track really is uh, through discipline. And, you know, the sort of my view, a, a lot of people ask me often, uh, you know, how do I get as much done as I, as I get done? And I think the real key is to identify what are the three, and it, you know, it might be four for some people, but it's sort of been drummed into my brain over the years. There are three key things that will make you successful. So you have to identify what are those three key things for your career, for your business, for a project. And then you prioritize those three things and focus on those three things. Now, in the course of a day, I get the opportunity for thousands of distractions. And it might be even stuff that's fun. Mm. And you have to have the discipline to say no and to stay focused on these three things. And if the activities that are presented to you don't connect with one of those three things or support one of those three priorities, then you either outsource it, you know, you delegate it, you eliminate it, or you say no. But you can't spend your time on these activities that will not get you to your to your goal. Hmm. Yeah, focus is a really, really important one. Love it. Okay, now what's the number one thing you think anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this right now. In fact, I'm um, you know, I'm working on uh, on a new book. And, and that's going to be part of, of, of that book. It's going to be a key piece of that book. And the, one of the biggest disappointments I have in our world today is that, that, that business and marketers are, are sort of guru-led <laughs> instead of innovation-led, mm. right? So we're guru-led because we, we look at the people we admire, like Elon Musk or Seth Godin or... You know, Richard Branson, who are these, you know, leaders that we look up to and what are they writing about and what are they pontificating about? And then we, you know, we try to be them. Mm. And, and what we end up with is a lot of average. And what really will get people to stand out is insight, not just information. Anybody can deliver information, but the real breakthrough and the, and, and, and the ideas and the points of differentiation will come through insight. And that comes through all the things that we've been talking about today is being aware and connecting, uh, connecting the dots. So I think having this discipline, really having a goal to, to, to zig when other people are zagging, right? Uh, one of the case studies that I'm working on for the book um, has to do with bacon. I figure, Jurgen, any chapter that starts with bacon is going to be successful <laughs> in my book. Yeah. So near where we live, we have this very famous little company that makes the best bacon in the world. And this guy learned how to smoke, how to cure and smoke this bacon when he was a little boy. So he started curing and smoking this bacon. And when he turned it into a business he realized he was going to go broke because his competitors had automated and they were they were selling their bacon at a price that was similar to what he was buying his raw materials from hmm. and he told his father he said i've got to automate i can't compete they're undercutting me on price and uh what his father told him, he said, when you start following everybody else, that's when you're going to lose. So he stuck to this process. Everything is hand cured, hand rubbed, smoked for weeks 
in these cabinets. And when this bacon comes out, it's absolutely the best in the world. Well, he has something that nobody else in the has world has had. He stuck to his point of differentiation and he was discovered by world famous chefs. And now he can't keep up, right? Uh, he's selling, I think it's, he's creating, I think it's 12,000 pounds of bacon a day now, uh, you know, at very good prices. He ships it all over the world. And so there's a lesson there, right? That we can't, if he did what everybody else is, did, was doing, he never would have made it as a business. And there's research that shows even in a recession, when people are conscious of price, cutting your price doesn't save your business. Differentiation saves your business. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good example. I guess the, the big question for me, though, is how, you know, what, what do you need, what mindset do you need to have at that point where the cash flow crisis, I guess, um, is coming in, where he's saying, yeah, these people are undercutting my price. I'm not selling based on yeah. price. Um, I can't yeah. get my message to people that this is really special bacon. It's worth paying more for. Um, at what point do you kind of transcend that crisis if you like, that that will drive you out of business if you don't do something different and, and move through to that, well, we are different and it's worth paying more money for. And Well, you know, I, I, I first of all, I, I want to say that, you know, for anyone who's listening, uh, you know, if, if you're, you're struggling and you're suffering right now, uh, I think we just have to have a lot of compassion about that. And we have we need to have a lot of understanding and, and a lot of grace. You know, I see in my world, there's a lot of desperate people who are doing a lot of what I would judge to be very spammy things, mm. things that are going to be very harmful to their brand as an act of desperation. Now, who knows, you know, maybe this is the last thing they know to do because they've got kids to feed. So I think we need to be patient about that. But again, you know, we, we have to manage our way to the other side in a way that that is smart, that is strategic. Now, I will say this fellow that makes this bacon and, and sells it for a higher price than any other bacon you ever buy just had a record month. You know, I'm working for a, with, a, with another uh, company, uh, a sausage company. In Texas, which is I'm really doing great right now, working with bacon and sausage <laughs> in the same month. So I'm very happy. Same thing. Um, you know, the last few weeks, they, they've been record weeks. It's the same sort of artisanal, small batch. They don't compete on price at all. They stand out because they make something that's good and special and and they're still being rewarded for that. So I mean, will that last forever? You know, uh, you know, I don't know. But I think there is a lesson. And more than that, there's research uh, that, that backs it up, that, that shows in a recession, cutting prices, you know, it's better to be different than to be the low price. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks for that. And thanks for getting us through the buzz round. Now, this is been absolutely fabulous um, talking about marketing and all these ideas of differentiation. Um, where can people find out more about you, Mark, and um, find out about your books, get a hold of the pandemic playbook, pandemic business playbook, and and perhaps even reach out and say thank you? Well, it's very easy to find me. If you can remember, businesses grow. That's my site. <laughs> so if you go to businessesgrow.com, you can find my blog, my podcast, my books, all my social media channels. So I'd love to hear from you and, and stay connected. Wonderful. Do you have any parting advice you'd like to leave our listener today? Oh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't emphasize the important message of the Marketing Rebellion book, and that is to be more human, right? Mm. I truly believe that in the end, 
the most human company will win. And so we need to examine every touch point with our customers, every phone call, every text message, every complaint, every meeting, every negotiation. How can we show our faces, our smiles, our hearts, our passion to be the most human company in our space? Because the most human company will win. Hmm. Yeah, very important message. Thanks for that. Now, finally, Mark, who, who would you like me to chat with on a future and Overbuzz podcast and why? Well, two people come to mind. We mentioned Matthew mm-hmm. Sweezy. He's one of the smartest people that I know and has written an exceptional book. Another person I would recommend is, uh, is uh, Brooke Sellis. She's an entrepreneur and a business founder, and she's uh, the founder of B Squared Media. And the reason that she's interesting is she has completely reinvented uh, online customer care and customer service. Uh, to be integrated in unique ways with with marketing. And it, if you've been in business and marketing as long as I have, you know this is a big, big problem. Mm. And he's completely reimagined this, reinvented this uh, in exciting new ways and uh, is one of the uh, most interesting uh, business entrepreneurs that I, I know of right now. Mm. Okay, well, um, we'll reach out to both of them. And, and- and 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 she's my co-host on the podcast. I was podcast. just going to ask that. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your co-host. Same yeah. person. <laughs> Same bro. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. The online customer care thing certainly is something that fascinates me. So, I'll reach out to Brooke and to Matthew, and um, we'll get them on the show and have those conversations. So, thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us so generously today, Mark. I've really enjoyed this. As I said at the beginning, I've I'm a big fan of the marketing rebellion in particular, and um, it's something that really reinforces my message of human marketing. And I've really enjoyed exploring the ideas a little bit further with you today and learned quite a bit in addition. So I wish you all the best for the future for the new book. What's that going to be called, by the way, the book about the... Oh, I haven't, I, I haven't announced okay. it Okay. <laughs> right. It'll probably uh, come out, uh, I'm hoping, early 2021. Okay. We'll keep an eye out at uh, businessgrow.com for that um, to come out. And, um, yeah, I wish you all the best for the future, and and let's stay in touch. Thank you so much, Jurgen. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and informative conversation with Mark and that it joins some of the marketing dots for you. I loved his reframe of the building relationship focus of marketing in that to cut through the noise, you need to win trust, to build trust and to be trusted. And that's the number one job of any business, any employee, any marketer, any leader. I'd love to know what you took away from Mark's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Mark Schaefer. That is M-A-R-K-S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R. All lowercase or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Mark Schaefer. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Mark there, as well as links to the Businesses Grow website, his books, his Pandemic Business Playbook, which you can get without even giving away your email, his social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Mark suggested that we have a conversation with Matthew Sweezy, author of The Context Marketing Revolution, and with Brooke Sellis of B Squared Media and co-host of the Marketing Companion podcast on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. So Matthew and Brooke, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Mark Schaefer. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast, where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Rob Thomas, founder of Networking in Diners, and creator of the lean startup movement, Steve Blank. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. 
I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.